with Glenn Alfred, as you know, I'm Pete. Um, just a quick introduction to what we do. So we provide cognitive behavioral therapy to children, adolescents, and adults. Um, and we're really, really excited to, to partner with the ASL Exchange and Naomi Garcia Lessie on this lecture. And we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Andrew Martin present on the cognitive and social impact of early language experience of deaf children, deaf children to the faculty member in the psychology department at Hampshire College, um, where she teaches child development, cognitive processing, and emotion. Um, and she, oh, you did your post at the phone, you told me to. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Um, and her research post focuses on the relations between developing language and cognition and the impact of early language deprivation and delayed acquisition in deaf children. So we're really excited for everyone to be here. If you want more information about what we do, feel free to approach um, me or any of the staff after this is over. Um, and thank you again for joining us. I know that some of you are online. I hope that the streaming goes well, but we've been having some technical problems. So if for some reason it doesn't, we will send out the recording as soon as we can. So thank you again. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to see so many people here today. And thank you as well to the Central Games Act for anxiety for inviting me today, today as well as Sadar and Manny for organizing this event. As many of you know, my research centers on research interest centers on the relationship between early, early language experiences and cognitive development. In today's talk, I'll be speaking more generally and broadly about research rather than my own work as that only myself. I'll be talking about both my own work as well as other work that is quite important for the understanding of general processes and general experiences that, ch that children have during development. It's important to understand the relationship between deaf children's early language experiences and the ways in which those experiences impact other areas of development. So today I'll be touching a bit on that as well as give you some of the background about what deaf children's language experiences look like. And in doing so, I'll be discussing two domains of development where we see the, the impact that language has on development. The cognitive and social impacts of early language experiences of deaf children is the topic of the talk today. The question we see here on the slide, how does language shape deaf children's cognition and social experiences and development? This question is a very fundamental question about the relationship between our language and other areas of psychological functioning within different cognitive domains, areas of mental health, social functioning, and the like. This fundamental question is broadly applicable to all children, not only deaf children. And in understanding how and what language does for us, and what language is used for, and how it might support typical functioning and development is an important question to ask. My interest specifically is looking at the variability of language experiences among deaf children and seeing how we can use that variability in that population, in their language experiences, to help us to understand this fundamental relationship between language, cognition, and social development as well. We need to be able to have a fundamental understanding about the nature of these relationships, both for understanding how the human mind works, and also when we want to intervene when these processes go awry. First, I 
perhaps for some of you who might not know so much about what deaf children's early language experiences look like, I'd like to give you a bit of background about that. In the United States, statistics show that from every 1,000 infants born, approximately three of those are born with some form of hearing loss. These statistics refer to children who have both minor or minimal hearing loss to those who are profoundly deaf. So it encompasses a wide range of hearing loss, those who have detectable hearing loss within this range. My back of the envelope calculations are seen here, which would mean that approximately 8 to 12,000 infants are born every year with some hearing loss. Now, I don't have it, but maybe one of you does. Uh, a specific uh, statistic about that 8 to 12,000 potential babies born with hearing loss, about what that, what percentage of them would have a profound hearing loss. For these children who have moderate to profound hearing loss, those are the children who are most at risk for language delays as well as other delays in development. And a little bit of additional background as well. About 5% of deaf children who are born to, are born to deaf, children, deaf parents, meaning that these children do not face language delays because their deaf parents are signing to them from birth, meaning their language acquisition parallels the language acquisition of hearing children who acquire spoken language from hearing parents. So when we look at those deaf babies of deaf parents, and compare them to hearing babies of hearing parents, we see that these two groups look very similar to one another. But for the other 95% of deaf children who do not have the benefit of being born to accessible language, for those children, these children face a lot of variability, variety in the signing experiences and exposure that they have for any language, both spoken and signed. Their language experience is very turbulent. Having language, sign language exposure early might be the case for some of these 95%. Others might have spoke, some access to spoken language, but these experiences vary greatly in that 95% of deaf children who do not have that early language exposure, those are the children who we're very interested in studying. It's interesting to see how that variability in language exposure might contribute to the variability in other developmental symptoms. Some of these children are able to get access to spoken language or time languages. But the age at which they're able to get access to that language depends on a number of factors, social factors. Their experience is very, very extreme. Many of you might be aware of one of the standards of care for deaf children who have severe to profound hearing loss. This is the cochlear implant. A cochlear implant is a device that's attached to the cochlea and it stimulates the auditory nerve. The implant allows deaf children to have some access to sound. In most developed Western countries, approximately 80% of deaf children will get a cochlear implant. But still, their language experience is very significant. Those deaf children who have successful experiences with cochlear implants depends on their age and, and the exposure that they've had to language prior to implantation, as well as a host of other factors. As I mentioned before, my research is driven 
by my curiosity, my basic scientific curiosity that drives and motivates my work is driven by this question. How do language and cognition interact and influence one another? I'm very interested in looking more closely at the basic nature, structure of those two interacting factors and the relationship between cognition and language. For most people in the world, most people are able to get that, they take that relationship for granted. Most hearing children do have access to language from birth, and so we don't see the impacts or see what would happen if they were not exposed to language from birth. So in order to see this relationship, we look at deaf children, and their variety of language experiences informs us as to what those relationships might actually look like. We want to understand why early language exposure is so important. We do have a lot of evidence that for most languages and in most modalities of language, there are critical periods for language learning. Children need to have access as well as the ability to acquire language from a young age in order to be on par with their peers. So why is early language exposure so important? We want to use this question to help us to understand the nature of the relationship between language and cognition. And lastly, of course, what happens when we don't get that early language exposure? Some of you might be familiar with some of the history. The history surrounding the promotion or resistance towards exposing deaf children to sign language. Since 1880, in that year, there was a famous Congress or conference, which was the Milan Congress. At this conference, many educators of the deaf who attended decided that it was more important for education to be focused on oral and speech development rather than promoting the sign language acquisition. And since that time, this has been a very common and prevalent view among professionals. Professionals still today are resistant to exposing sign language to young children. The pretext for this justification to resisting teaching deaf children sign language has changed over time. For example, in the past, the rationale was that spoken language was important for functioning within society, and that speech was important to be able to access religious services. That was the pretext to resisting teaching sign language to deaf children. Today, the argument against resisting teaching sign language comes from a neurological perspective. There's a neural argument. The argument is that we have limitations in the neural, in neural plasticity. And so we should not allow deaf children to acquire sign language because if in doing so, it will prevent their ability to learn speech later in life. So there's a few quotes I'd like to share with you that will demonstrate these two views. This first quote comes from the Milan Congress in 1880. This was part of their declaration. In their declaration, they stated, the convention, considering the incontestable superiority of articulation over signs in restoring the deaf mute to society and giving him a fuller knowledge of language, declares that the oral method should be preferred over signs in the education of deaf mute. So this was the argument from that 1880. More recently, we see the same argument, but from a different vantage point. Some people more recently argue that we have limitations in neural plasticity. For example, research has shown 
that the areas of the brain that are used for auditory signals will be taken over by other types of visual processing. People have argued that that takeover of visual processing will then not allow the brain to be able to process auditory stimulation. And I'd like to read a quote to you that represents this perspective. One paper suggests that, that the use of sign language will prevent, well, you know what, let me just go ahead and read it to you. This is coming from the paper. Higher cognitive functions, such as the interpretation of sign language, could have occupied the underutilized auditory cortex. This implicates cross-modal plasticity as the cause of continuing lack of hearing response in these prelingually deaf patients. From this argument, now we see that people are saying that we have limitations then to neuroplasticity. It might be hard to see here, uh, but we do know that this argument does not hold water. People still today will make this argument that we have limitations then to neuroplasticity. And one can see, looking at this paper, this recent paper that actually argues this point of view. There's also another paper that argues against this point of view. And you'll see that at the bottom of this slide. So if anyone is interested, I can certainly provide that information to you after the talk if you're looking at seeing the original article, the 2013 from Lens. So there, was there is resistance to providing access to sign language, and the nature of that resistance has changed, but the consequences still remain the same. So again, I want to emphasize the 5% of deaf infants that have deaf parents do not face language delays. We often use this DOD to mean this acronym you see on the screen to mean deaf children who have deaf parents. So DOD means deaf of deaf. Deaf children who are born with hearing parents, if those hearing parents do not sign, and the only thing they're exposed to is spoken language, all of these children do face language delays in their acquisition of language. They are not getting full access to language exposure, and so therefore they're not acquiring language very easily. Oh, sorry about that. Let me plug this back in. Let me get this back up on our screen. Good, here we are, we're back. So as I said, the reason for resisting teaching sign language may change, but the consequences are still the same. When we look at the research since the 1960s, that's when there started to be an explosion of research in, uh, with the, in the development of deaf children. So if we look at the children and the history of that research, we get a record of the delays that deaf children face. There's a lot of evidence that there are different domains that deaf children face lacks. For example, in mental health, there are delays and there are lacks. Not so much a delay, but perhaps a difficulty that they face in mental health that might include depression and other areas. In many areas of cognition, deaf children face uh, display delays, and we have evidence and research for that. There are different areas like executive functioning, Things that uh, in, uh, the ability to inhibit impulsive behavior is what is considered executive functioning, or the ability to plan ahead is considered part of executive functioning behaviors. So, deaf children face delays in that. Also, in the area of numeracy, children's concept of numbers and acquisition of numbers and number terms, deaf children face delays, and also in social skills. For example, the theory of mind. 
that is the under, that is understanding that other people have different thoughts than one's own thoughts. So there's a lot of record in the research that show there are deficits and delays for deaf children. So what we need to do now at this point, and that's my responsibility as a researcher in this field, is that we now need to focus and analyze more at the, looking at the mechanisms behind these documented delays that I just mentioned. So that comes back to the question about what is the nature between language and cognition for me? If we can understand the nature of that relationship, what it looks like, we can begin to understand why deaf children are experiencing these significant delays, and then we can start to plan interventions. So now what I would like to suggest is instead of focusing on what deaf children do, I want to focus on why we are seeing these kinds of significant delays and what are the mechanisms that drive these delays. So I'm suggesting that language is one of the most important places that we need to look at to help us explain and understand these kinds of delays. And I would like to suggest two ways that language can be supporting our cognitive processes. Language can support the cognitive processes through building specific linguistic structures that help us to be able to understand syntax and phonology and specific language structures that will then provide us the structure to build our cognitive processes on. The specific uh, syntax structure helps drive cognitive development. And it is one way that language can support or one of the mechanisms that that relation shows the relationship between language and cognitive processes. The second way that language can support is that it simply provides more access to information. Deaf children lack access to a lot of information. They're not hearing people talk in the world around them. They're not getting information that way that hearing children do they don't hear another child picking on another child or picking their nose. So deaf children don't have access to some important social and general information possibilities in general. So I would like to suggest these two different ways that language can actually support and give us the ways to look at these relationships. So, First, by looking at specific linguistic structures, and secondly, just looking at greater access to general information that a language can provide to us. So today I'll talk about two areas. One is looking at theory of mind, which is part of social cognition. It's not my field of research, but other people are looking at this theory of mind, and I will share their work with you and what they find about the relationship between language and theory of mind, which is part of cognition. Secondly, I will be talking about spatial cognition, which is my area of expertise when I'm researching, and I will share some of my work. So we'll begin with theory of mind. And you might not be familiar with it, but it is an integrated understanding that people's behavior is influenced and shaped by their knowledge, beliefs, desires, and intentions. So it's the understanding that you can predict another person's behavior if you know something about their mental state. Theory of mind research uses many different subscales, more than what I put up here on the slide, but these are the three that are commonly seen. So first, di diverse desires. So that's the understanding that people want different things. 
So if I like apples, but my friend likes grapes, then I understand that my friend will want grapes and not want apples like I do. They have different desires. Secondly, you see diverse beliefs. The understanding that people can think or know different kinds of things than one does, and know that that I might know something that they don't know. And third, you see false beliefs on the screen. There's a lot of research, and specifically research I'll talk today will focus on this last area called false belief. And that's the understanding that people may have different knowledge, and that knowledge sometimes might be wrong. And so one's ability to predict another person's behavior will depend upon what you know about what they don't know. And here's an example I'd like to give you about false belief and the task that's given to children and how we test young children to know what they think about what other people know or don't know. So a researcher will give a child this task, a story. They'll say, this is Anthony. Anthony is reading a book. When he's done, Anthony puts the book on the table and he leaves. Look, Anthony's friend Sonia comes in and moves the book from the table and puts it in a drawer. And then Sonia leaves. Anthony comes back to read some more. And now the task is given to the child. Where will Anthony look for the book? If a child has good theory of mind, they would say, oh, well, Anthony will look on the table. But a child who doesn't know yet, who's not able to predict someone else's behavior, will say, oh, Anthony will look in the drawer because the child knows that Sonia put the book in the drawer. So typically, when we look at developing theory of mind, three-year-olds before they're five, typical three-year-old children, hearing children, would say before three-year-olds, uh, before five, they would say, well, Anthony will go look in the drawer. Three-year-olds will think that Anthony will know what they know. But by five, children typically will say, well, Anthony will look at the table. That's easy. They know that. Of course, everyone should know that. Anthony doesn't know where the book is. So at five, hearing children find this task very easy to pass. Deaf children show a sig significant delay in understanding and acquiring theory of mind. Even by the ages of eight, a third of deaf children who learn sign language late, who do not have deaf parents, so they have late sign language exposure, one third of these children still will not be able to pass this kind of false belief task. Here I put up a, a graph of a, one person's research, and you look at two middle bars. These are deaf children who only were exposed to oral methods of uh, education, which is learning to speak, meaning they're only exposed to spoken language, not any sign language. And they per that's the bar on the right. They perform worse than those in the center. So children who have deaf, deaf children who have deaf parents perform quite well because they have had access. And to whatever that relevant information is in the language experience related to language, these children are having access to all of that. They're able to use their language to help develop theory of mind. And we also see that there is a correlation in general 
with vocabulary, your vocabulary and syntax predicts a correlation with theory of mind performance. So we see that children, deaf children who have access to sign language, do better on theory of mind tasks. So what does that tell us about the nature of that relationship? What is language providing to these children to help and support their theory of mind development? And there are different hypotheses about this relationship and how this relationship works. One hypothesis is that language may provide information about mental states because you get the words for think and know. And these words provide children with access and exposure to the unseen mental states of others. So that speaks to exposure and access to information. Another hypothesis is that the children are incorporating specific sentence structures and these syntax and sentence structures that the children are learning provide them access to language and these complex structures support the need for developing theory of mind and reasoning about mental states. So in order to test this hypothesis, researchers have looked at the understanding of specific types of syntactical structures called complement structures, specifically looking at false complement structure. And in doing these types of tasks, we look at different types of sentences, such as the one you see on the slide here. Sally told Anne she had a bug in her hair, but it was only a leaf. In the test, researchers will ask the children, they will provide them with a sentence that has this type of false complement structure, and then ask children, what did Sally tell Anne? Children then have to be able to understand that that specific type of complement structure you need to be able to understand the complement structure in order to be able to answer the question correctly. So deaf children were tested using American Sign Language as the language that the question was asked. So there is a parallel complement structure in ASL to spoken English. So for deaf children who use sign language, the question was asked in ASL. For, for oral deaf children, the question was asked in spoken English. And more specific than general measures of vocabulary, if we look specifically at syntax structure, this predicts children's success on theory of mind tasks, and specifically false belief tasks. Deaf children who sign American Sign Language and understand that syntax structure, those children are then able to pass theory of mind tasks. Deaf children who are oral when they understand the syntax structure in English, those children are also able to pass theory of mind tasks. What we see is that when we have deaf children of deaf parents, those children pass these tasks earlier. And I know that this chart might be a little bit difficult to read from where you're seated, so I'll break it down for you. So the line that you see on the very top, the dotted line, we can use that as a measure of a typical a typical development that represents hearing children. And with age, we see that children pass more false belief tasks as they get older. And this is um, on the left, we see that the score is on seven false belief tasks. And we see that the number of false belief tasks that they're able to pass increases with age. At four, 
to the age of four, we see that hip-hearing children pass four out of seven of these falsity tests. Deaf children of deaf parents perform equally on par with their hearing peers. There is no difference in the rate, the pass rate, for these deaf children of deaf parents. And as their hearing peers, their abilities to pass these false belief tests increases with age. With the third group, which is deaf children who do not have early exposure to sign language, deaf children of hearing parents who are later exposed to American Sign Language later in life, and the second group of deaf children who are raised orally without exposure to sign language. If we look at deaf children who are exposed to sign language later in life, they have a bit of a delay early in life, but then catch up to the hearing peers and their deaf of deaf peers at later ages. We also see that with oral deaf children, they also show delays. So again, those who have exposure to sign language early and consistently, those are the children who are most likely to lead to fast false belief tasks and perform on par with their hearing peers. For those children who are exposed to sign language later in life, it takes them a little bit more time to catch up. And oral children still continue to have significant delays as they develop. What this suggests is that one of the ways or the nature between that relationship with cognition and language is that linguistic syntact structures will provide specific supports for reasoning about other people's mental states. And importantly, that early access, early access to language is crucial for supporting on-time development of hearing mind. Okay, so as I just discussed, this was part of the social domain, and now I'd like to shift gears and talk about spatial cognitive abilities, and this is more my area of study. Today, I'll be discussing some of my own work. So first, we want to ask the question, what is spatial cognition? Spatial cognition refers to the ways that we use how we use, learn, store, recall information about our spatial environment. And there are many different aspects of spatial cognition. These areas involve things such as mental rotation of objects, as you see on the image on the left. For example, if you were to look at this image on the left, you'll see that there's four pictures. On the top picture, you then need to decide which of the images on the bottom, which of the three match the picture on the top. And the way in order to do this successfully is to mentally rotate the picture on the top so that it matches up with one of the three pictures on the bottom. That would be a task of mental rotation. On the right, we see another type of spatial cognition skill, which is navigation in the environment. The ways in which you're able to find yourself around town, for example. And we're continually updating our place in space and where we exist in the environment as we're navigating through it. So these types of skills then allow you to get around in the world. Why then is spatial cognition so important? We have a lot of evidence for the relationship between spatial cognition and academic achievement. For example, spatial cognition skills seem to relate to things like math and science abilities. So they're linked to the fields of math, mathematical conceptualization, and science class. So in order to be able to perform successfully in a science class, one needs to conceptualize a molecule and the way that it moves mentally in one's head. So you're relying on spatial skills in order to understand this type of information. There is a relationship between having good spatial skills as well as science and math abilities. In addition, spatial cognition is important for social settings. It helps you to learn how to take on another person's perspective, like you can see in the picture on the bottom. If you look at this picture, 
and you know what the other person is seeing. You'll know that the other person is seeing something different than you are. And this is very important when we're trying to negotiate different social events, the ability to take on the person's perspective. So this work, my work with spatial cognition, really draws from the work that I've been doing in Nicaragua. A lot of my work with spatial cognition is done in studying deaf children in Nicaragua and understanding the relationships between the, their development of language and spatial cognition skill. But before I go into the research, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about this community in Nicaragua. In this Nicaraguan community today, there are approximately 2,000 members of the deaf community. So, Deaf people who interact and socialize using Nicaraguan Sign Language as a mode of communication um, is comprised of 2,000 members in Managua. Deaf children's experiences here seem to be very parallel to deaf children's experience in the United States. We see the trajectories look somewhat similar, although fewer deaf children have, uh, very few deaf children have deaf parents in Nicaragua, just like in the United States. And what this means is that these deaf children are not having early exposure to language, just like in the United States. There are some things that are different in this community. There is a delayed late age of identification of deafness. I don't know exactly what, or I don't think we have uh, figured out exactly what that age of identification is, but it's likely around the age of four or five. In the States, however, infants are identified at birth as being deaf, typically. So what this means for most deaf children, their very first exposure to any language takes place in school. So the first day that they show up at school is also the first day that they have exposure to any form of language. And this typically is for children around the age of four or five in Nicaragua, but sometimes it can be later in life. Some children don't enter school until they're later, at late older than four or five. We see then that the first exposure to language varies significantly, much more so in Nicaragua than it does in the United States. Infants are typically identified in the United States early on, and then there is some form of intervention, exposure to sign language at an early age for children in the United States. So going back to Nicaragua, when we can actually identify the exact day at which these deaf children are exposed to sign language because it corresponds to their first day of entering school. So now I'd like to take a broader view of the community and give you an understanding of the history of Nicaraguan sign language and how it is that I've done my work. Because the actual language itself is a young language. Nicaraguan sign language is young and has changed rapidly over the past decades. I'd like to give you a bit of history about the language to help you understand the work that I've done. In the late 1970s, there were no deaf schools, up until the late 1970s, there were no deaf schools in Nicaragua. Individual deaf children or adults would be in their own homes, isolated from one another, and would rarely meet. For many of these deaf children who were alone at home, they would develop their own gestural systems, which we call home signs. So they might use those home signs to interact with people that might be in their family. And again, these gestural systems were different for every individual, and there was no standardization or standard gestural system between different deaf people in Nicaragua prior to the late 1970s, 1970s. And again, we call these home signs. Then, in the late 1970s, the School for the Deaf opened, and many of these individual deaf children came together for the first time in the same place. So these deaf children came together in the school, were interacting with one another, and each of them were bringing their own gestural systems to the school. And it became this sort of big pot of languages that were interacting with one another. And that's where we saw the emergence of Nicaraguan Sign Language. Each individual deaf child was bringing their language with them. And this is the origin of when we see deaf children creating this language. So the school opened its doors with about 50 deaf children in the first year. And with every incoming year, more and more children enrolled in the school, and the school size grew. So what has happened with these gestural systems? Those children who brought their own systems 
started to interact with one another, and there were changes that occurred systematically. Those who enrolled in school first started to make modifications and started to conventionalize words and signs. And then with every passing years, new, new kids came into the school. And those newer kids would then look at the older kids and start to adopt and use some of their signs. But those younger kids that entered school later did not simply take the signs of the older kids and leave it as be. Instead, they would continue to make modifications to the language. And as those newer kids grew up, there were, of course, newer kids, younger kids that were enrolling in school, looking up to them in turn and taking on their signs and not keeping them as it is, but rather making modifications. So with every year, newer kids were enrolling into school, younger kids taking the language of the older kids, making modifications to it. And this is where we see this slow but significant change in the development of the language. We've divided these group of children into, based on the year at which they entered school. So the group of kids, um, each cohort spans about 10 years. Those who enrolled in school between the late 1970s through the mid-1980s, we call that group the first cohort. The second cohort comprises kids who enrolled in school at a young age, and they acquired the language of the first cohort. Took that language, they usually entered, uh, th that cohort entered between the late 1980s to the early to mid 1990s. So they took on that language. Then the third cohort entered between 19, the mid 1990s for a 10 year span. So now that third cohort, just so you know, the first, second, and third cohorts are all, all of these individuals are adults today. We also do have cohorts four and five, and they're still young, so we, they're still attending school. But of these community language users, the cohorts one, two, and three are all adults. And by looking at their use of language, we see that the Nicaraguan Sign Language has changed. Each incoming group of kids has taken the language of their elders, passed, uh, made modifications to it, and passed it on to the incoming group of students, who also made modifications. So, my postdoctoral mentor at Barnard College has done a lot of research looking at the changes, specific types of changes that have happened between cohorts one, two, and three, and has really taken a detailed look at what the nature of those changes are and what structural changes emerge in the language over time. Her research has found that there are many types of spatial modifications, changes in the use of pointing, for example, in sign, and the emer that is an early emergence in language, and that changed across cohorts. One thing that I'd like to discuss today is the emergence of the use of the x-axis. And I'd like to give you a quick explanation of what the x-axis use means. If you would like to describe who does what to who using sign language, there's different ways that you can do that effectively. But sign language can take advantage of the, of the space in front of one to exemplify this. So if you pretend that me, I am somebody, and I am giving something to someone else, and I'm using the x-axis, which would be using the space for my body, excuse me, correction, that is the z-axis. So I am giving something outward to somebody else, to a person standing in front of me. That's using the z-axis. So it's from the reference point of the self. Sign languages also can use the x-axis, which is the space, the neutral space in front of one. So for example, if I'm representing a person in space to my left, that person could be giving somebody some, uh, something to somebody on the, my right. That's a use of the x-axis. The use of Z versus X axis changes systematically with the development of language. And this is one change that we've seen in the Nicaraguan sign language. So for my research, I'm interested in the question of mental rotation capabilities and if that changes across the cohorts. 
I compare a, adults who have learned the Nicaraguan Sign Language in the different cohorts, and I look at their mental location capabilities. And I also look at ASL signers here in America to compare across countries. And the reason why that I'm incorporating ASL signers also is because I would like to look at the variety in the age of language acquisition. So my question is, if people learn and acquire sign language early in life, do, do they perform better on mental location tasks compared to people who acquire language later? So I'll give you a quick definition of my research. I look at mental location tasks. And what I do is I show these pictures, this picture on the screen, this represents a computer that I use, the computer screen. I will show the participant two objects. And the two objects on the top, the child or the person has to decide what in the picture matches the object on the bottom. I also compare different areas. I look at geometric shapes as you see the blocks on the left. I also look at the human figure as represented by the doll on the right. And I am also comparing different planes of rotation. So if you, you can look at the horizontal plane and how blocks and figures move. So that's how a picture might move. And I'm looking at vertical planes. So I give them pictures of both vertical planes and horizontal planes, and how objects move on these planes. And so this graph shows you what I found, that mental rotation performance does increase across the cohorts. Performance on the tasks becomes better with later cohorts. I'm just going to add a comment about this graph. So when you look across cohorts, they all likely have the same age of exposure. It is when they arrived at school, and they arrived at school at a young age. I have mentioned they're adults now, but they all arrive at school around the same age. So the age of acquisition does not differ, only the year of when they entered school and the nature of the language that they were exposed to at school. So first, I'm looking at the change of cohorts, and now I'm looking at the age of acquisition. So my question is looking at how old they were when they acquired language, and does that affect their mental rotation ability? So now I look at both ASL signers and Nicaraguan signers, because I want to capture that range of age of acquisition. So I look at ASL native signers before the age of three, all the way to people that don't learn Nicaraguan Sign Language until after the age of six. So this graph represents that. And what I found that people that have early age of acquisition perform better on mental rotation tasks than people who learn later. We see an increase in the skill of one's mental rotation when they are exposed to language at early ages. Also, I find a different performance when I compare the geometric figures, such as the block, with the human figures, as exemplified in the doll. With the doll figure, everyone tends to perform better, except for hearing students, the hearing children. Signers perform well when looking at mental rotation tasks of a human figure, as represented by the doll, compared to the Performance on this simple geometric shape does not increase until we arrive at cohort three. So this graph requires a little bit of explaining. I didn't, I don't think I put all the information that would help you right there. Here, what I'm showing is the people who use the X axis and who use the x-axis a lot in communication. Those people tend to do better on mental rotation tasks. A 
over here on the purple bar, you're seeing people who are not using the x-axis very much at all, and those people tend to perform less well on mental rotation tasks. So what I'm looking at here is the performance on the x-axis or the frequency of use of the x-axis as it relates to performance on a mental rotation task. And the specific use of that structure in language, the x-axis will contribute to an increased performance on the mental rotation task. So this suggests a few things, and I have pictures here. Early language, that cohort one, tended to use the z-axis that I talked about more often. And you can see the arrow there is showing just in front of you. You're signing. It, this is signing a punch. You know, someone's punching someone else. And they're using the z-axis. Later cohorts, the cohort three in this picture, are using the x-axis and more frequent use of that. So it is possible with using only the z-axis, that might help some understanding that we see in the efficacy of the, of the human figure, the performance on the mental rotation task. They're able to perform well looking at a human figure. Later, the performance with a geometric shape does not increase until we arrive at cohort three, where there, we see more often a use of the x-axis in their language. So there's two things that we learn about the nature of the relationship between language and spatial cognition. One is having a richer space, a rich use of space helps language and the complex use of language and that emerges in cohort three. That enhances their understanding and their ability to use mental rotation skills. And we also see that the earlier someone uses sign language, the better they perform on spatial cognition skills like mental rotation. So it's both the nature of the language itself and the age of when the child acquires language supports spatial cognition. So to wrap up, overall research indicates that specific language structures will contribute to enhanced cognitive and social performances and behaviors. And both of those domains, social and cognitive domains, depend upon consistent, continual access to language and the linguistic structures that are provided. So what this might mean to professionals or parents that have deaf children or work with deaf children is that we have to keep emphasizing early language exposure is important. The earlier they ha that happens, the better it is. We have to emphasize that it has to be language that the children can access easily, that modality, that we need to prevent delays, and that sign language offers that ready access to these important linguistic structures. And access to these linguistic structures will enhance the cognitive and social demands. So we have to make sure that we are thinking about encouraging early and consistent and concept, constant access to language through specific sign languages, because that is the most accessible modality for deaf children to access. So I'd like to say thank you. I have a list of references. If anyone is interested, I can print them or share them with you somehow. Happy to do that. So thank you so much for your attention today. All right, I guess I can entertain any questions if someone would like to ask some questions for me. I see one in the back. Yeah. Um, I want to conference once on cochlear implants.
in the woman who gave the presentation kind of said that in the brain, you're talking about neuroplasticity, that if I taught the kids sign language when she got a cochlear implant, there would be not enough room, I'm quoting her, teach the child oral communication. And then the next week I was fired by the mother for using sign language. So I want to know, have you ever heard of this? Is it true? I don't even know where to begin. This child um, had been fluid on the brain and some kind of tooth that somehow damaged the auditory and the child did not get the cochlear implant and she was out of business. Yes. This type of this is su the suggestion or explanation for why we should not expose children to sign language is similar to what I mentioned before. And we hear this very uh, readily in researchers have actually used this as an explanation, like what I showed you earlier. There is a publication that specifically discusses, a good publication that specifically talks about why this argument is flawed. And I do have the reference here. Um, I, I don't have here, but I can give it to you if you'd like to look at the original reference. Um, let's see, here it is. Yes, it is right here, Linus. Do you have it on the slide? Some of the ideas from correlational studies seem to show that deaf children or people who are implanted and have already learned sign language, have reduced ability to use the auditory cortex for auditory type things. So they're able to use that auditory cortex for visual things. But the problem with a lot of this correlational research is that we have the correlation causation problem. It's very difficult to be able to control for actually the intervention of visual, if visual language is interfering and also the passage of time. We have a confound. So there's many types of fa other factors that those researchers have not been able to control for. So their interpretation that the reason why we see these reduced abilities to use the auditory cortex for auditory type things is based on those types of correlations. And it is difficult to control for those factors. But it is premature to make these types of interpretations simply on correlation. Really, it's the same idea that's been around, you know, um, putting on new clothing. Same idea that we should not be teaching sign language, um, but the reasons have changed, but the impact and the consequences remain the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a concern that many parents might have. Yeah, yeah thank you for asking. Okay, other questions? Yes. I was wondering about in our research in the education system in Orlando, is it difficult because you use ASL and you don't have the ability to have clear structures and how it's going to be changed? Or is it not difficult because it's mm -hmm. parallel? Okay, that is a great question. And your question really targets on the assumption that many people have, that sign languages are universal, they're all the same all around the world, and obviously you don't have that assumption. So you know that in that question, it shows that you know that there is a difference between American Sign Language and Nicaraguan Sign Language. When I'm going there, I'm studying a language that is not my own. So how do I then study people who use a language that is not my own? Yes, uh, when I, it means that I do have to learn sign lang Nicaraguan Sign Language, and I did learn some Nicaraguan Sign Language and it is a learning process. But many of the ways in which we are able to make measurements, those measurements do not require me to actually sign the language myself. For example, I can show a video of something, a stimulus, and then the child will then need to sign what is represented in the stimulus. So I personally don't need to be able to produce or always have the use of the language at my ready disposal. I mean, I do use Nicaraguan sign language when I'm in Nicaragua, but I'm not a native user of their language. But there are many ways in which we can measure their language that does not require me as the researcher to have fluency in Nicaraguan sign language.
language. So we might show the child a picture and ask the child to describe the picture in their language or show a film to them and ask them to describe the film. So yes, that is a good point. I am not a native signer of Nicaraguan Sign Language. So how is it that we measure their language? And there are ways to do so. Oftentimes we will film their use of language and then look for the different types of structures in their use of language by looking at, the, at that footage and see the emergence of different types of linguistic structures over time. That's a good question. Yes. It looked like the NSL were Is that correct? Yes. And did you ever look at, or is there a need for looking at the footage of those NSL games and wondering if they also have any visuals to it from the actual spoken English of the language happening? Good question. Yes, we do. You did see that correctly. Hearing children fared worse than deaf children. Cohort one in Nicaragua performed better on these mental rotation tasks. So it seems as though some exposure to sign language is important to the development of these mental rotation skills. And it might en enhance this ability. And we see a similar comparison when we look at ASL signers as well. Hearing people who do not know American Sign Language fare worse off at these types of tasks than signers do. If we're looking at CODAs, children of deaf adults, looking at CODAs might help us to answer some questions. For example, we could say, is the effect from language itself or is it from a lack of hearing? So by testing CODAs, that population, children who are hearing but who have sign language, and comparing their performance on those types of tasks would help us to answer these types of questions. I don't know if there has been any research with CODA children on their school rotation. There's none that I'm aware of that I've seen. But yeah, if we had a question like that, we we're interested in looking at the relationships, specifically targeting on whether or not it's something about being deaf or language, then we would want to study that group of children in order to be able to answer it. Good question. Uh -huh. So one of the participants in my home, you know, you said that you're not a native Nicaraguan signer, but if you were a native, would you sign in American Sign Language? I learned ASL quite young, yes. But I am I did not I mean to say, I did not learn Nicaraguan Sign Language until I actually went to Nicaragua. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We might have one more, but I'll take it. <laughs> How can we encourage educational programs in ASL instead of looking for So for me, the goal is not to not teach using oral methods, but rather to encourage the use of ASL. The reason why children can't have both languages, there's no reason why children cannot have both languages. Today, there is more exposure to spoken language if one has a cochlear implant. But my goal is not to, not to discourage sign language use because we can see how important sign language use and exposure is when it comes to many different cognitive domains. And, and that early language exposure seems to be key. So again, my goal is not to have, uh, be against oral approaches, but rather to promote the use of sign language and early exposure to it. Thank you, good question. Any further questions? 
Yes. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if the study the culture, if, it, if there's been a strong development of deaf culture within Nicaragua similar to the US, and if that can also be used to encourage people to study deaf culture. Um, In Nicaragua, there is some research looking at the emergence of that community, particularly since the founding of this school, where we saw for the first time deaf people coming together using language. There was some minimal contact between deaf culture and people prior to the foundation of the school, but today we do see a strong deaf community where people uh, know one another, interact with one another regularly, enough people know each other, but also it's large enough of a population that not everybody knows everybody within that group. And so that is an indication that there is a good time to be in Nicaragua. I do think that there is more awareness and people are becoming more aware about Nicaraguan sign language in Nicaragua. And especially with the passage of time since the opening of the school, more people have heard about it, are seeing the language, and even with hearing people, they, some of them know that sign language, Nicaraguan sign language, is a unique language, and it's different from other languages in the world. That is a homegrown language, literally. And they're proud of it. So there is still a need for information sharing, and sharing this type of information with parents about the school and about the importance of Exposure, but yeah, the community itself has grown. It's grown significantly over time. Yeah. Yes. I know something you said that the university has a how that all the students Social media and other things. So, and I think it's a question. It's a question. It's a question. It's a specifically the impacts of technology and the ways in which technology can open up ways for increased interaction. The ways in which we can meet and hear about or see, have more access to different types of things and information. Today, with our new forms of technology, we have different ways of communicating. And it provides easier access compared to people who lived in the past. Many deaf people today still do like to meet in person, but there are other ways in which one can access each other through use of technologies. Yeah. I just was reading an article. It was a study about infants that are born deaf to hearing families. And the hearing families would bring them to an audiologist and the audiologist is not aware of what the deaf community might have and other options. And the audiologist only advises or counsels getting a cochlear implant. And that's a huge impact on parents' decision about what language they're using teaching their child. Yes, yes, definitely. There's, a, there's arguments that because of the increased access to auditory stimuli or simulation, that there is a strong focus there, a drive towards that. And I would argue that we cannot ignore the, the easy and reliable access to language that sign language provides. With cochlear implant, it does take time from the time of identification to implantation. So that time gap that exists there, 
um, does have an impact. And also, once one gets a cochlear implant, one does need training as to how to use it and uh, be able to comprehend and understand the sounds that are being processed with the cochlear. So that's a factor to take in as well. For me, the important thing to remember is that sign language offers the same types of benefits that spoken languages offer. And they can offer these things earlier and more consistently. My so just so you know, I'm signing for people on this on the screen, uh, just people that are watching it. So yes, the general medical perspective is that there is an encouragement of excluding the use of sign language for children who are deaf. And one thing that we could do a better job of is educating people in the medical profession and parents about these types of things, these findings that um, there are equivalent benefits if one is exposed to sign language as compared to languages using a spoken word. All right, any further questions? If not, then thank you so much for your attention and do let me know if you'd like the list of references that I have here. I'm happy to provide them. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Hadar. I'm the office manager here. I just want to remind everybody that the fruit and the pretzels are all for you. Dr. Galanti is in another meeting, so she couldn't wrap up. But thank you so much for coming. And on your way out, if you did not sign in, please do so. If you have questions for us, I'm here, Dr. Sobin is one of our therapists, Dr. Polly Kaplan, one of our therapists, and of course, I think we'll be sitting around for a little bit also. So thank you again. Thank you. Well, I think I can talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.